YouTube um, channel. Uh, we Today we have Liza Loop, Cynthia Solomon, Brian Silverman, and Margaret Morbido. Um, so uh, Liza Loop uh, is in the Loop Center. <laughs> she, uh, she's been uh, teaching with computers since, what, 1976 is the year, um, starting with the Apple I, perhaps a little earlier. Uh, Cynthia Solomon, Brian Silverman uh, started quite early with teaching with Logo and continued with other projects. And Margaret Morbido uh, had done some online teaching with um, on QLink, CompuServe, Genie. Um, so today we we're going to continue our conversation. We had a great conversation with everyone last time, I think in September. Uh, so we're going to continue the conversation and, and see where it goes. So. We'll start with the first question that I have. Um, how did the educational community react to the idea of using computers in the classrooms during the early, early days? Uh, we'll start with Liza. How did they react to computers? Because these were new things, right? Personal computers. Well, in a, a personal computer was new, but there were a lot of computers in schools in the administration. So they were doing, the school catalog, doing some scheduling, doing attendance. Um, and, and I think that the, the big shift was from the com computer as a business machine that crunched numbers and, and did statistical stuff to the computer as a game player, a curriculum delivery, an interactive um, participant. Um, and certainly that was um, early on, we had a project called Computer Town USA, where we put computers in schools. That was with Bob Albrecht. And, um, and what Bob used to say is, because teachers often were terrified of computers. They were, they were terrified on, on two levels. One was that they, would, they, they felt stupid because they didn't really know how to use them. And the other was they were afraid that somehow they didn't know enough to know that the computer could never replace the teacher. Um, so what Bob did was he put the computer in the teacher's lounge, not in the classroom to start with. So the the teachers had a chance to get comfortable with the medium before they had to quote perform on stage in front of their students. Of course, the the the, the folks that were that found it easiest to in, incorporate computing into their into their curriculum were the math teachers. Mm. Who, who were who wanted to learn to program themselves and often were happy to um, to get down on the floor with the kids and learn about computing along with the kids and let the kids teach them uh, so ah. <laughs> go ahead <laughs> what are you laughing at this we started we started this discussion because we wanted to talk to each other the audience is superfluous which I want to hear what you have to say to me all right. What do you think, Cynthia? If you work with a different population. Oh, all right. Yeah. Teachers, <laughs> except or, and also, um, I, I think uh, when you're talking about personal computers, you're talking about the '80s, and I go back to uh, the late '60s and the '70s where time-shared computers were the, were the thing. <laughs> there, and um, the math teachers were not any happier than other teachers. And they were unhappy because they were going to have to learn something new and they already felt overburdened. And I must say that the whole introduction of computing until recently was done in a very poor way. Teachers were given one day workshops and that was supposed to last for a whole semester. Or maybe it was two days. And if they had a summertime, maybe they could volunteer for another week. But preparation was really, I would be scared if I were a teacher with them because of having to learn a lot 
and not having an opportunity to play, to be a child, to learn, to find what I like and what I don't like. And the kinds of things we want to see ch children experience and that the power of computers for us is that we can do find things that really interest us whether it's a way of reading a book whether it's a way of expressing um, some poetic thing whether it's um creating with you know, for me, it was the, the thing, creating um, projects of various sorts. Mostly for me, it was graphics. Um, anyway, I just had to laugh. I'm sorry. When you it. No, it's an honest reaction, and, and everybody has a different experience. <laughs> And that's why we have all of you together because you all have different experiences. But the, the volunteers, the, the leaders were usually math teachers. Mm -hmm. That is sure. absolutely the case that there was a wonderful teacher in Lexington, Massachusetts. His name was, um, I can't remember, it'll come to me. And there was a wonderful teacher in Colorado. They were math teachers. And then there were some, this was in the 60s when, when there were research projects going on. And there was, oh, and of course the um, Plato project in um, at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana um, had first working with high school, and then later with elementary schools. And it was a very exciting. That project was very exciting. All right, Brian, do you want to also answer the question? Sure, or I could try to not answer it. it is, you, you're, you asked the question as like a singular reaction. Very hard to give a singular reaction because <laughs> the, um, the, a lot of the reaction depended on one of the dozen different ways you were introducing computers into the classroom. And it also shifted a lot over time. And um, I was going to chuckle at the same point of Cynthia, because if you focus in on, um, I remember that in mid 80s, I did a round of math ed conferences. Um, those were the people that were least interested in computing. <laughs> And it may have been the case that in the 60s and 70s, you know, the math people saw it because, you know, the um, forward looking math people saw programming as a way of kind of um, bringing math to life. But by the mid 80s, um, we found that the stuff that Cynthia and I were doing, the logo project, was succeeding more with elementary school teachers than with high school teachers. And there was almost the more teachers were into math, the less they were into the kind of computing that we were doing. Interesting. Well, and, and but I think I think I was talking about 70s, and you're talking about 80s. Well, the 80s. Yeah. No, that's what I was saying. Is, 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 shift yeah the reactions did shift as as the deck explained. okay that's a good answer margaret what do you what were your um you know impressions of you know it, how the people reacted in in the early days well i started working for run magazine and i was run magazine is for a commodore 64 magazine and I did a series of articles, um, a column for a year or so called the Resource Center. And through that column, teachers throughout the country who had Commodores in their classrooms would write to me and tell me how they were using their computers. So on the one hand, what I received from them was uh, a myriad of ways that they were using their, their Commodores. And they were all very positive and very enthusiastic. Now, in terms of like what subject teachers they were, we actually had English teachers. You know, we had com uh, computer technology, we had technology teachers, um, math. But I think one of the most popular that I remember was an English teacher who started up an educational BBS in Texas. This was in his school district. And the purpose of that was to allow students to log in 
and for one thing, learn about telecommunications, but for another thing, be able to do uh, after school uh, homework help. So it was an example of an early use of computers using telecommunications for um, instructional purposes. And so um, through the through the magazine, through the column, I wrote these articles, uh, I wrote the stories of these teachers and it was very well received. And so in terms of how did the educational community react to the idea of using computers, at least in the, in the idea, in the aspect of the home computer, which teachers were using in schools, such as the Commodore 64, it was very well received. Now, when we get up to 1985, later, later part of 85 and early 86, the Commodore network quantum link came on. And that was particularly designed for Commodore users, Commodore 64. And so uh, I submitted a proposal to them, and it was received, to start up a nationwide tutoring center. Now, that tutoring center instantly was a success. We had tutoring sessions in all the different academic subjects, you know, math, English, science, various uh, computer programming also, even foreign language. We had Japanese. I mean, we had a full, a full gamut. And we would run tutoring sessions, one hour tutoring sessions, um, Monday through Friday during the non-prime time hours, which were in the evening, and then on the weekends. And you could go the full day on Saturday and the full day, well, I think starting 1130 on Sunday. And we would be packed. And it's uh, from my perspective, looking back on it, it was an instant success in, in two ways. The students from a wide range of age ranges wanted to have a way to access uh, instructional tutorial services from their homes in an inexpensive way. Our tutoring actually was free. All you had to do was pay for the Q-Link hourly uh, subscription, which was $3.60, something like that. But in the, on the other hand, we had teachers who would contact me who would say, yes, I would love to teach in the tutoring center. And so we had teachers from all over the country who signed up and, and would be part of this program. And that was, that was in uh, early 90, uh, 86, late 85, I sent in the proposal. So it's right around that mid 80s point. And then not only did we do the tutoring sessions, but the students then were asking us for structured courses. And the teachers were willing to do that. So by the time we get further into 86, I was running what I called the QLink Community College, where we did eight week courses. And uh, again, it was something that was widely um, received and it was really embraced by the educational community on both the instructional side and on the student side. And from my side, I was the administrator. So I was doing all of the administrative work online at that time. So it was an example of a school that was totally operating online. And uh, as far as I know, it was the first national school that was doing that. So that was my uh, experience from back then. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Does anybody else have any questions for anybody else based on what they said? <laughs> of, of us? Yes, of you. Yeah, I, I always have lots of questions. But <laughs> all right. Well, well, we do that before I proceed with another question. All right. Well, well, I, I think it's really it, it was a fascinating decade because I'm thinking my my younger son is um, turning fifty next week, uh, so he was born in seventy three, and when he was in he he changed from a private school to a public school in fifth grade or maybe it was it was it was either fifth or sixth grade in palo alto california so his and uh and of course by then i we he had we had computers in the house and both his his mother and his stepfather were deeply into this he was very co computer literate and i remember having a meeting with his teacher so that would have been 80, 85, 84, 85. And, um, 
and saying, well, of course, Jonah has a word processor, so um, he, he can do his essays. Um, he, he can provide piped essays. And the teacher said, absolutely not. He is not allowed. This is Palo Alto, California. He is not allowed to use a computer at all because I have my students right. They can't use computers. Mm, so I, I, think, I think we have to temper our answers by looking at the piece of the, 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 the overall education community that we've been in communication with. I mean, Margaret, if you're getting people who, who know about Run Magazine and they're writing for Run Magazine, they've already bought in. So you're gonna get a, a, a much more positive response, I think, than I might have gotten if I was going into a school where there were still teachers, even through into the 90s, who were afraid. And there still are teachers who are afraid. Now they say they're afraid of AI, not just computers. But I, I'm not sure they're differentiating. I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you, Lisa, in terms of the, um, the, the structured mainstream educational community was not as receptive as let's say the the outliers who were at home who could afford a computer such as a low cost Commodore 64 who embraced it and then brought it into their classrooms and you know went you know just ran with it but you're right the educational community you know per se was slow to adopt it it, it, it still is place. I mean, it's the pandemic that that has thrust it into everybody's classroom. Yeah, the pandemic definitely made um, video conferencing mainstream because before that, I mean, it was it was available and it was good. You know, it's obviously um, made leaps and bounds since you know the early days. You know, AT and T or Bell, whatever it was at the time, had these video phones. And like that was like, wow, that's really cool. And you had to have you had to have that to to make actually make a video call. But that was like, wow. And then you know we had the technology, but a lot of a lot a lot of people used it. Not a lot of people uh, un, um, understood how to use it or wanted to use it. Um, but then the pandemic was like, all right, you have to use it and you're going to figure it out. So you're going to use your figure it out for your work and we're going to figure it out for school. And you, you have to figure out how to communicate, um, you know, like that very quickly. So then now people are very comfortable with it. They're like using it all the time. So that was a case where it was something that people hadn't used a lot, but they had to figure it out. So can I? Okay. Yes, Brian. So when my oldest was in fourth grade, um, we had a word processor at home. Exact same story. The teachers said, nope, can't use it. So what they added did is she'd actually do all of her drafts on the word processor and then just hand copied it for the final. Yes, yeah, so she would hand in a hand copy. But one of the things that, that was said already that may, and maybe we're talking around a little bit more, is to the extent that there were different reactions. There was a certain kind of reaction we got when things were brand shiny new and the flavor of the month, which led to a different kind of reaction when it started being old hat, when it led to a third kind of reaction when it started feeling old and about to be replaced. Because it is the case that um, the people who were early adopters to the stuff we did, almost by definition, were early adopters. Right, mm -hmm. and that led, and I think Lisa, you were trying to say something like this, that led to a different kind of self-selected audience. Yeah. Right, and- We're still, we're still trying to get the Luddites. Well, oh. but, but I found that the more interesting phase of the stuff that we're doing is beyond the early adopters, because you know the early adopters are chasing, you know, what bus, you know what's the most buzzwordy thing now right? Where the stuff that we're doing, I think, is more enduring than that. You know, so, so the question is, is, so what's happening, not when the thing first gets uh, gets introduced, but two, three, four years later? Or 10 years yeah. later, or 20 yeah. years later. Well, my question is, what is the stuff you're doing that you think is so great? Me? Yeah. I I'm mean, doing what you suggested. <laughs> 
your statement. Yes, but but when people make statements like that without giving me context. <laughs> yes, context. context. I wanted. I second that question. What are you doing, Brian? Oh, what, oh you know, it's funny though because um, <laughs> Seymour Papert was teaching at the Hennigan School, and one of the stories that he liked to tell is three or four months into the project, he'd go up to somebody randomly and say, what are you work? What are you doing? They'd say, I'm working on the computer. Okay. <laughs> and then six, eight, 10 months in, you'd, he'd ask a random kid and say, what are you doing? And they said, well, I'm programming in logo. And <laughs> then a, a year or a year and a half later, he'd go up to a random kid and the answer would be something like, I'm working on my skeleton project. Mm -hmm. That's but, nice. I want to raise another question, though. All right, sure. Which is today, folks are complaining that because of computers, kids are not being taught to write in script or cursive. Yeah, cursive. That's the word, cursive. <laughs> and that they're missing a lot because of that. And so this is. This is in the current popular yeah. world. So anyway, I just wanted to talk. What do you think? You, you brought up the question, Cynthia. What, what's your response to the answer? Or, or how do you feel about that? Well, I, I would feel very bad if they couldn't read. And that's worrisome. Read, read the cursive handwriting. Oh, yeah. It, whether it's cursive or something else. Yes, they should be able to read with cursive as well, I think. We touched on this point in our last session. And I know that Margaret had a view that was maybe 180 degrees out of phase with mine. And my view on this one was um, I didn't... Uh, have the hand-to-eye coordination to properly form letter, form cursive letters. And when I got to word processing, I felt liberated and be able to actually start writing. So well, that's me, gonna, that, actually, Brian, that was one of the benefits early on that I saw of having computers was that if you had a word processor, it did encourage you to edit your work. It was easier. You didn't have to erase, you didn't have to white out. You could see it up there. And like, if you, you said, oh yeah, I got to change that. I, it's T-H-E-R-E, it's not T-H-E-I-R because you knew it in your brain, not because the computer told you, but you could go up and very easily fix it. And that was a very, I think that was a great benefit early on of, compute, of computers in education, especially the kids who had word processors or word processors in school where they could use them and do editing. What I see a kind of a problem with these days is that back then, the student, it was the responsibility of the student to know how to correct his spelling or his grammar or or insert that sentence, you know, however he wanted to, you know, structure his paragraph. It came from him or her, and then that person could go in and make the edit, and it was like a great thing, like, oh, wow, it's so easy to do. It encourages you to do it. Whereas nowadays, uh, a concern is that the computer does it for you. And that's where, that's what I was getting at last time we met, is that when you take away the inner ability to do those edits and you have the computer doing it for you, I think that that's a, a slippery slope because some students are going to take that route and it means that they lose out on something. When they become adults, they go out in the uh, in the working world. Um, they don't have they don't have those tools in their minds that they had in uh, the old the old days back in the eighties. Right, right. But where the last time discussion that we could maybe have another round or maybe avoid it this time. Um, Cynthia <laughs> started off by asked, by saying that some people think that what's lost is the ability to form letters with a pen on paper. And oh yeah, getting back to Cynthia's question yeah. about cursive writing, yeah, 
I actually, my experience with that, I'm an administrator of a school. We have forms that people have to fill out and people have to sign. And what I've seen deteriorate, because I've been in this business for so many years, is penmanship. So you get people now who are signing their names and it's just like a scribble. And, it's, and, and I say, and my staff, we get back to the student and we say, we need to have a legible signature. So then, you know, they have to resubmit the form so that we can at least kind of read what the name is. But it reminds me of uh, back in the old days, you know, way back where it was like, well, if you don't know how to write, just put your X there and it'll be okay. And that's how this, many of the uh, students are these days. It's like, I just put a scribble. I won't even look at what I put there. So uh, that's my experience with cursive. It's, it's, uh, it causes us to do more work. Yeah, I, I, I had used to, uh, my handwriting was always terrible. And I used to blame my second grade teacher. He didn't teach me well enough. But now having a different perspective of being a teacher of elementary, I can see, yeah, it's hard to teach 20 kids and then to follow up to make sure that they're doing it. You know, it would have been nice to ha have parents to help me, like, practice it. But mine was always messy. So I was very happy when I got to ninth grade. I think it must have been some mini computer on a terminal. I actually learned how to type. Because um, what happened was when I was doing a handwriting, my mom would type it up on a typewriter. So we're, we're also, that's a, something you guys didn't talk about. You went to a, she had to type it up on a typewriter, my papers, because they were illegible or they needed to be neater. It was better. So she would actually typing up my essays or papers or whatever on a typewriter. So then when I got to ninth grade, it was great because then I can turn to type it in when I, uh, bought a used Commodore 64 and a word processor. Oh my God, my mom was great and happy because then she didn't have to type it up. I could just type it up on a word processor. Um, and it had limited um, uh, spell check. You know, there was a separate program who can, you know, with a limited amount. But that was my, you know, process, you know, from written to typewriter to, to word processor. Okay, I want to withdraw anything about cursive writing. <laughs> well, because what's interesting, and I think it, it's going to be more of a, it's going to be an interesting debate moving forward, as well as was looking backwards, is um, technology lets things happen automatically. And what we have to do, what we need to be thinking about, is you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And trying to get a clear idea of what's the baby and what's the bathwater is not only subtle, but it's controversial. Yeah. Now, you know, I think we were all feeling that cursive writing was the bathwater. What I think we weren't agreeing to last time is whether or not the spelling is the part of the baby or is part of the bathwater. And as we're moving into the AI age, I'm not even going to take a side on this. A whole lot of creative writing is going to be automated. Is that something that we should look back from 10 years from now and say, okay, um, that was the bathwater, not a whole lot was lost? Or should we say there was something really cognitively important there that we let go of? Uh, well, I, I have. Go ahead. Oh, go on, Lisa. Um, it's Liza. Uh, Liza. I, I, <laughs> and I, I've got two ideas competing for my tongue here. Uh, I need a technology that'll let me follow both mental streams at the same time. Um, one is that the more we're dependent on a, a manufactured machine, the more um, uh, equity issues come up because if you don't have access to those machines, uh, then you're somehow handicapped. If if you don't know how to write and you don't have a word processor or a typewriter or whatever, then even if you can think really well, um, you don't have that particular communication technology. Um, there, some people think that we are actually getting, uh, if you compare people that lived in traditional societies, hunter-gatherer folks, 
with people that live today, um, our cognitive ability is decreasing because we have so much help uh, that we don't have to be as good problem solvers as someone living without um, without the modern support systems that we have. Now, I didn't say I thought that. I said some people think that. So, um, I think, but I think I do think it's worth contemplating and exploring the idea that the more technical support scaffolding that you have, um, the more manufactured. Um, an interdependency you have between people, the less the individual has to do and the less individual freedom and agency they have. So that's a long, far cry from cursive writing and yet cursive writing itself is a technique. And the study of cursive writing is a technology. If you go back to the meaning, the Greek meaning of those words. Um, and every generation loses some technologies and gains others. And many, many situations, the older people say, oh, you're losing X, Y, Z. This was so important to our culture. If you lose it, uh, you're, you're losing something. Uh, and often they're not looking at the things that, other, that, that the next generation is gaining and learning that the previous generation didn't have. So I think there's arguments on both sides. There's the independence and self-reliance argument uh, and there's the, the three sides and the gaining, losing different skills and abilities. Um, that's two anyway. All right. Who else? Uh, Margaret, did you want to say something? Um, well, this is kind of veering a little bit, but as part of my job as director of the school, Cal Campus, uh, I've been in charge of leading the accreditation team and every five years we have to renew our accreditation and one so we have to fulfill certain standards that the accreditors specify for us to do and one of them is the impact of instruction and within the impact of instruction it's not just the testing itself but that is part of it but it's also verifying that the student within a distance learning environment, which is what my school is within, and these days many schools are, to be able to verify that the work that the student is doing is actually coming from the student. That's something that comes up. So one of the thing, one of the tools, and one of the methods that we use is proctored exams. And with proctored exams, we say to the student, you cannot use computer, you cannot use online. You're actually working offline and you're handwriting your work in front of a proctor. So it's a very traditional proctoring exam um, environment. This is something that's important in terms of if in these days now, if you have students who can do their work and always be able to access information online, whether it's research information or if they're writing their papers in Google Docs. That's the thing that I'm more familiar with now because I'm actually working with students who do that. Um, or a similar interface where they're typing out their papers or their answers, their short essays, whatever it may be. And the Google Docs is saying, hey, you know, you got to change this, you got to change that, you should be changing this. Um, and then they get into a proctoring traditional exam setting where they've got to do it themselves. Uh, that causes problems. I can see that that causes problems. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, that's the that's the independence dependence issue I was trying to point at. So that's a, a exactly good... right. Yes, exactly right. Are, are and we, so are... it comes in, it comes into play with schools that have to prove to the accreditors that they are fulfilling these certain standards and that they are uh, making sure that the students themselves are doing the work. So it, it comes up. But I, I think that they should have, they should be able to do it both ways. They should be able to know how to, you know, edit and spell things, but then 
you know, once they get comfortable, then, you know, then they should have something where they can click on the little red wavy line and fix the spelling of the word. Because like, so I do that sometimes, like, how do I spell surveillance or something like that? And is it the EI or IE? You know, I sort of know. So um, once I write it down, I can probably see it. But then, you know, it's become very easy to just like type it sort of like it is. And then, okay, I'll just then just fix it. So it's just become you know, it becomes a bad habit to just not even try to just roughly do it and then let it fix it. Uh, Cynthia, you have any comments? Well, this all goes to about evaluation. How do you evaluate people? Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, colleges, how are they going to evaluate the applicants? Um, government, how are they going to fund this and not that? How do they evaluate? And um, that's, I mean, how do we impose that on children? And in what ways do we impose that in, on children? We, we've done a very poor job of it so far for children. Um, you know, as, and uh, I, I don't know. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah, Cynthia, I know what you mean because with children, you don't want to squelch their creativity. No, you want them to blossom, and you don't you don't want to put a damper on that. I, I know what you're talking about. Adults are a kind of a different situation. Most of my student, the the majority of students who come to our school are adult learners, maybe up in their thirties even. But we start we start squelching kids' creativity as soon as we put them into school, as soon as we put them into an educational institution. We, the, we, put, we put them into sensory-deprived de environments and say, now, behave yourself. We put them in play pens. Um, it, it, you know, I, 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 part of the reason I'm not a classroom teacher is because I'd have the kids hanging on the ceiling. Uh, <laughs> um, but if we're, if what we want to talk about is creativity, um, there's there's a huge um, anti-creative uh, trend through all of of institutionalized school. Uh, so because of evaluation, because how are you going to grade? How are you? <laughs> And you know, e, what is that place? E, that awful place that does the SATs and the other it's stuff. The testing service. What? ETS. It, ETS. ETS. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, but you know, how do you, if you're going to send it out and have everybody, and you want to be fair and all that, it it's a very difficult thing to do, and um. It's one thing if somebody is applying to college because there there's a goal. Do you know? I want right. to go. Sorry. I want to... Yeah, I wanted to get back to the point of dependence and independence. And I kind of feel like I've well, I've left I let myself become very dependent on technology. Okay, that there's this technology that does happen to be about 150 years old called eyeglasses. And um, yep, three of the five of us have them. And if I didn't have them, I'd walk into walls. And the fact that I'm dependent on this technology doesn't, it, it at some level doesn't bother me because it's always, well, uh, we were, Liza, you were starting to say well, technology. Um, what's a good definition of technology? My favorite definition came from Alan Kay. He said, technology is that stuff that wasn't around when you were born. I, I would disagree, but. I don't um, like that definition. Oh, well, we're supposed to like Alan's definition. But I have but, a better, better one. Well, <laughs> the, thing, the thing about it is, I think it's okay to allow oneself to become dependent on the technology when there's a reasonable expectation that technology is going to be around. Um, so, yeah. no, Cynthia, we ha we had an ice storm in the spring. Our power went, power went up for several but, days. But if Are you had that, 
the, if a developer thought in that ter those terms, nothing new would be invented. It's almost the reverse because the thing that the thing that we've done no, is if you blind yourself, and even though you say that, you don't really practice it. Uh, no, what's what's interesting, Cynthia, is you developed explicitly using technologies that were very rare when you were doing that development, but with the expectation, which was correct, that it would become commonplace. Mm -hmm. So, as developers, the yes, expectation, but I couldn't guarantee it. But it, it there was, there there was <laughs> you can't guarantee anything. It, it, it was a good guess. It, oh, it was okay. a good guess, and it turned out to be a correct guess. And right, right now, um, and the thing, Cynthia, the thing that we've seen at various points since then, there's been technologies when we first started working on them were rare, but eventually became commonplace. Computers being the first one, the internet and the internet in North America being the second one. You know, internet is just universally available. And no, no, no. Liza, no. Liza and I not in rural and poor communities. Fifty percent of the Canadian landmass has no internet connection. But fifty percent of the Canadian landmass has no people. Yeah, but it has sparse it has people okay it doesn't it's not densely populated that's the point that's in places it. where it's not densely populated you it's too expensive to put it in but it's funny that we're not going to live long enough to do that i would bet that in 20 years that would be a soft problem uh, it might uh, we, that we was just, a big problem we're, back in the eighties. We're, we're going to no, get into for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. But to quote the much too often quoted Wayne Gretzky is, you know, you don't play the puck where it is; you play it the puck where it will be. But right. You know, this go, going back to the vintage you know, times, back in the eighties when we were all starting to go online because people were getting their home computers. The, and I'm from a rural area. This was a big deal, the expense of calling a packet switch network. For me, I had to call long distance. It's about 50 miles away. And so I would rack up all these phone bills just getting to the point where it could then call QLink, PC Link, Apple Link, yep. AOL. You know, so that was something that was a big issue back then. And uh, it definitely has improved now, but certainly from what I, I over and where we are now of course we've got it all over the place uh, you can get to the internet easily it's a big issue online easily. my colleagues in in the refugee camps in uganda where they have to buy all of their create all of their connectivity um there is connectivity sometimes for several hours a day there is electricity for several hours a day. They have to buy both and there's no employment. So even though the, the physical infrastructure is there intermittently, the access to it is horrendous. People are going without food in order to be able to get on the internet. So could I ask a question? As a developer, yeah. should I only develop things that could be used for all of the 8 billion people on the planet? And Some should, I, should, I, should I delay thinking about a new technology until that technology is 100% universally available in all parts no, of the world? Of course not. That would be silly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so um, so w what do we do about the issue you're talking about? We, 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 we need to be realistic about access. We need to be realistic about dependencies. We need not to have all of the houses in Texas uh, heated by uh, electricity, then have the grid go down and have everybody cold. Because uh, nobody, I mean, I have a pellet stove. I have a stove. Actually, my pellet stove is a bad example because it doesn't work without electricity either. But um, if we become totally dependent, totally dependent. On, on electricity, and and the grid goes down 
we're all in trouble, just like the folks in, in the lesser developed areas. So we need to do both, the independent, we need to maintain our ability to function with low tech independent um, arts, techne and art are, the, are basically the same thing, skills. And we need the modern advanced ones and be able to, to, to switch when the infrastructure fails us. I, I think it's called awareness in education. Mm. And I don't think you have to worry, Brian, um, I, about the things you're developing. Um, but I think the world has to be responsible and see that more research is needed, more things are needed without the costs. It, it's like when you were talking about the first generation users, of, uh, teachers using computers. Well, those computers became totally obsolete very quickly. So where does the money come from for them, those wonderful first generation people to get new equipment, okay? But this is something that politicians, government, whatever, human beings ought to be aware of the need that it, it's like training. It isn't a one year, I mean, a one day event. And that people don't think about that. And the cost it may seem high, but in the long run, it isn't. Because education learning is not, uh, uh, it, it is a value that's not, that's incomparable. I mean, what can I say? I'm sorry. <laughs> but there are issues about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it always, I mean, I, it really tore my heart when we had turtle geometry, turtles in 1970, and I couldn't share it with people. Right. And then a couple of people, man, you, you know, we started a company in 1972 to make turtles. But still, it may not in enough, you know, still, I, I, uh, there's that problem, <laughs> okay? But that's, Equity and access, I think, yeah. are, the, are, are the, the buzzwords okay. that we use today for those two things. I see. Um, do you want, I can take, if you guys want, uh, this is maybe a good point, I can take a, qu I have a question from the, the uh, YouTube. Um, okay. This one is for Liza. Liza, it says, can, can you summarize your vision for um, a project about future uses of vintage computers in classrooms? Vintage. Education? Yeah, I think there's a very important use, and we touched on it in the last conversation. Um, the vintage computers all came with a programming language. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to understand garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and that the best way to learn garbage in, garbage out is to actually program a computer to do something and tell a lie that you know is a lie. So when you when you understand that what the machines and the communication technologies, technologies are, are saying to us, it's somebody put that message into the machine and it comes out on the other side the machine doesn't have the intelligence people do um so so the vintage computers are much easier to program than many of the um the modern ones which are often used as controllers rather than communicators so that's one one use um they the games are fun and simple enough so that you can understand how to build a game as compared with um, the modern immersive video games where beginners are not going to be able to understand how to build a game at all. Um, they're still intrinsically motivating. 
Um, they're, so they're a good hook for getting people involved. And then those people that want to become engineers and professional programmers can go in that direction and, and the rest of us can use them as, as pieces of history. It's, it's really interesting to uh, interview people who've played uh, the Oregon Trail game, the early Oregon Trail game in schools. You ask them, what do they remember hmm. about or Oregon Trail? And there's two things that they remember. One is whether they did or didn't die of dysentery. <laughs> yes. Oh. yes. But the other is whether they managed to build a mental model of the game so that they could win or not. Mm. And the the mental models that we build of the early computers are simple enough so that um, people who don't, for whom this process of building systems analysis and building mental models isn't spontaneous, they can learn to do it through interacting with a, pro a computer that they can program where it's harder to teach it in other environments. That's what I was teaching when I was teaching computer literacy largely. Um, did, did that, is that responsive to the question, do you think? I think so. Um, anybody, anybody else want to add? Anybody want to add anything, uh, Cynthia? No? Right, uh, Brian? Um, I don't know that it's a property of vintage computers. It's a property of system design. That okay. some, systems are, some systems are designed to be more construction kit-like. That what you do is you build using a pretty well understood collection of parts and everything is what you do with the parts. To say that simple computers were simple, they weren't if you unpacked them all the way down to the circuitry. But nobody did because they, the, all of that stuff was used to build up something simple. Now, did it, I'd say didn't something- Didn't you use cardiac? I beg your pardon? Didn't you use the little paper computer, cardiac? I don't know that one. I did have um, what was called, there was a plastic one that, um, do you remember the plastic like logic? Yeah, I, um, I, know what, I know what you're talking about. Uh, I don't know what it's saying, but I was gonna say, um, Cynthia these days is very fond of Turtle Stitch. Turtle Stitch is sitting on a huge complex piece of technology, but Turtle Stitch itself is like a simple construction kit, right? So, you know, I think the, the thing is, is if you design systems so that there's well-defined parts and well-defined ways of connecting them, it kind of doesn't matter if what it takes to make those well-defined parts, and uh, you know, it, it, it could be complex or it could be simple. And the design, the design sensibility back in the early 80s was much, much more lent itself to the thing that you're talking about, which I agree is a very good thing. Was it um, Digicomp? Yeah, Digicomp. Digicomp, yes, we have one of these in the museum. Yeah, cardi Cardiac was earlier, I think. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I had that as a kid and I was able to figure out how to use it, but I didn't really understood how it really worked until about five years ago. You know, it, it, it's actually what's going on in there is quite subtle. Exactly, but at least you get a physical model that you can begin to think about. It's like Seymour's gears. See, when Seymour Paffert was talking about what started getting him going computationally, he had he liked to play with gears, mm. and that was his initial set of systems. But I, um, I never had the idea of model, and I'm, that's a very powerful idea. But um, now I, uh, it's part of my world. But it was never part of my world. I never understood what people were talking about <laughs> when they were saying. Um, I, grew, I grew up with a ship, uh, uh, a bottle. With all a, with through the seventies, eighties, and nineties, I didn't know what a model was. <laughs> so mm. For me, a, a model was an airplane that I used to make with my brother. Yeah, you know? but not a model about a computer. I never understood it. <laughs> that's that's a um it's a metaphor well now i understand but i'm just saying <laughs> years ago you didn't understand 
and and that's what we need. I think it's very important um, to to get help kids who don't spontaneously develop that concept yes. develop it. Uh -huh. I mean, my my experience working with with kids early early on in in from seventy five on was that there were the kids the kids and adults who spontaneously built mental models of how the computer worked or how the program worked. And they loved it. They had fun with it. There were a group of people who could learn the model or learn to model if you told them about it. But and told them what a model was. I could write programs. And is that, I mean, now you're, see, then I get into what is the model. And I can create micro worlds. I don't know what, but it never dawned on me that that was a model. Well, uh, think of your think of your uh, paper airplane or your little plastic airplane. Well, I mean, today is a different story, but I'm just saying that that um, these terms. It might have been what I was doing and what I was sharing with other people was model building, but it wasn't something that. Um, and uh, and the reason I raise it is there are probably other people like me. <laughs> sure. And then explain the terminology is what what you were talking what they were talking about. So you didn't understand you were doing it, but you didn't understand that you were doing it because they didn't explain to you what it was they were talking about. Well, they probably tried. It's like, it's like the fact that you're speaking prose and you didn't know you were speaking prose all this time. You've been speaking prose. Oh, it would be great. Yeah. Um, I have another question, someone. So this one is. Can I say about, one last thing before we move sure, on? Go ahead. Yes, sure. Um, the, the talking about models is actually quite interesting because Liza was saying models are it, and Cynthia seemed to have a really productive career without um, understanding. Maybe she was speaking prose all along, but she wasn't getting it. Um, so, but what Cynthia's one of Cynthia's big contributions to the early days of Logo was to think about the concept of meta language rather than just mm -hmm. language. Most of the people, you know, the language designers were designing the language, but Cynthia, what you, you took on was the job of not only thinking about the language, but thinking about how to talk about the language. And uh, meta languages and models are interestingly similar and interestingly different. Oh. Right, in that um, maybe I could try this. A model, the way Lisa is using it, is in the spirit of the meta language, but more precise. Okay. I mean, we could we could talk for hours yeah. about this. Yeah, we could talk for hours about this. So we could schedule the next session about this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sure. I mean, I'm going to go back um, as I did this time and go back to see what questions were asked, which ones were not, um, and you know where we might want to continue. Um, so, Margaret, do you want to have, have any comments before we move on? No, I'm good. All right. So another one. So this one is for uh, logo. So it says. Um, so Eric Rangel says, I am also interested in future applications of logo that can bring back the best of what we had and teach advanced features of the language. For example, lit processing. Um, what do you think about that, uh, Brian? Um, or, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Cynthia, do you want to go first? No. No, okay. <laughs> I'm not picking on you after you make it. Uh, well, look, I, I had to pass the pick on you a little bit, but um, it's a very interesting question. Um, at some level, and I think I, it's far be it for me to say this, the advanced uses of Logo are moving into real programming. And these days, for moving into real programming, Logo is a bit of a dead end because advanced logos aren't widely implemented across a lot of platforms. You got frozen. Oh yeah, did I come back? Uh, yeah, it's about, that's because I wrote my my you know, my browser's written in logo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's it, it, it's strange that um, one of the things that um, we did a lot with logo, where it wasn't really necessary to get advanced. 
And there actually, there was, um, there was a magazine called Logo Exchange, which I don't know if we remember this. This is as far back as, as you know, very vintage. And one, one issue of it, the theme of the issue was, what do you mean by advanced logo? And my answer to that one at the time is advanced logo isn't really using a more advanced language. It's using that language to play with increasingly powerful ideas. So are you saying that, that the initial logo instruction set was powerful enough so that you could play with it with increasingly um, complex ideas? This yes. is, I think what I'm trying to say is now 50 years later, back in that day, there really was a much, um, much looser distinction between using Logo as a kid and being, being a real programmer. Right, these days, the difference between doing turtle stitch or turtle art and being a real programmer, there's a vast gulf there. And, you know, if the goal is to be looking at Logo in a vintage-like way, you know, that would be really good. If the goal is being using it as a stepping stone to the grown-up programming world, it, it, Logo may not be it anymore. Well, but there is something like in the 80s, um, I, I, Alan Kay set me up in a research lab for Atari. And our, our one of our goals was to make a new logo, a logo that was object oriented and had lists. This person's question involved lists. And I think that is is something that the old logo didn't have. We had sentences, um, but not really listed. The um, uh, scratch was was made on top of logo to be a more modern logo, but very limited in in the kinds of uh, capabilities it had. And um, snap was designed to be a more advanced version of um, logo and scratch. And it, uh, I mean, there's an example, that's, that's all I'm, I'm saying, I, I think, because it was um, the, the initial push for scratch was Brian was involved and Mitchell Resnick who were part of the logo contingent at MIT. And SNAP was a brainchild of Brian Harvey, who was a logo enthusiast. Um, but when you look at these languages, you don't necessarily see logo in them. Um, and uh, they're still, uh, Seymour always talked and we used to have meetings, but nothing, no funding came through of designing a modern logo. And in his lifetime, we never did. And these, uh, these are versions and <clears throat> of people's ideas about a modern logo, I think. Um, and I think that Brian is right when he then opens up the world of chat GPT, which is going to very much change the way programming happens. Um, we see that with turtle graphics, the Python people have captured it and embedded it in, you know, this some Python package for turtle graphics. And the other thing, I can't remember its name. There's also something. Anyway, um, I, I think that some of the ideas of procedurizing, being able to make, well, blocks of your home and um, having uh, variables whose names are not limited to X, Y, and Z, um to, to um being able to to have a conversation 
about your what you're coding is part of a logo philosophy and chat GPT, that kind of thing is going to encompass it. I'm really curious as to to have you enlarge on that idea, but I'm not sure we have time enough in this discussion. Well, Brian is has been um, playing around, uh, haven't you? With um, okay. yeah, no, but it's funny. I agree with Lisa, but this is a uh, you know, it a could be that if we're going to be doing another session, I could suggest oh, okay. maybe the title of the next session. I don't know if this would be interesting to everybody, is the past, present, and future of educational programming. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, any more comments before I move on to the next question? Well, I just, I, yeah, I want to make one more comment, which, which has to do with um, language, a general comment about the development of a language, whether it's a computer language or a human language. They usually we have some sort some set of target concepts we want to talk about. So we create a way to communicate the items and the relationships between the items uh, and instances of items, um, items or concepts. Um, and what what I think we're seeing today is a development of a lot of different special purpose languages that work for creating pictures, creating um, videos, creating um, doorbells or interpreting facial faces. And um, nobody's going to be going to learn all of them. Logo was a particularly important way to communicate a set of ideas, <laughs> but not a general purpose programming language. Uh, basic was beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code. It, a, a lot more more practical stuff got programmed in Logo, but it, well, I mean, it wasn't it, all a general purpose programming language. Um, it certainly was more more general purpose than basic. It, it had it different extensions, but neither, oh, neither from the beginning. From the beginning, why it wasn't just turtle graphics. It was um, you could write programs inside programs inside programs. There was mm -hmm. recursive thinking in it. Um, it was a full-blown programming language, unlike basic. Basic, you know, when it started, had 14 primitives, period. I, I get it. Uh, I just I, I logo logo did not. People are not learning logo. People who want to become professional programmers are not learning logo today, are they? No, but um, a lot of 40, 50 something professional programmers, if you ask them how they got started, they say yeah, it was started logo. With logo. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm trying to be responsive. The basic, the basic that's avail available now has is nothing like the basic that was oh, yeah. in competition with logo at that time. And we weren't. Oh well. Anyway, I just get it. I, I, I was I was not saying they were comp competitive. I think they're both dead languages. Is all. I, I mean, for not. for professional programming, but we can agree to disagree. We're never for, oh, I I see what you mean by you meant professional programming, not not general purpose. You see, that's different. Professional programming and general purpose language are not the same. Okay. All right. Any more comments, uh, questions from you guys before I move on? All right. So another one. Um, I, this says it's for everyone, but I think this is uh, good for Margaret to answer. Um, have you ever seen examples of individualized education where teachers can customize online coursework for individual students in ways students can contribute enhancements to lessons? Well, yeah, to individualized instruction, um, that's actually one of the big benefits of online learning is that you can individualize instruction to your students. Uh, that's what we do. In our model, which uh, I think other schools 
not all of them, but other schools can follow or have followed. We require that there's uh, weekly assignments that are submitted. And through the comments from the instructor back to the students on those assignments, that's how the instruction gets customized for that particular student. So in our school, we have individual rolling admissions, for example. So we've got people coming and going at all different times. We don't have a classroom setting per se. So when one student is on lesson two of a 12 week lesson, 12 week course, someone else might be on lesson 11. But the point being, through the comments back to the students, that's how we actually individualize instruction because you can see what someone's understanding, what someone's not understanding, what someone needs more explanation about. Um, and, and that's how we proceed. So I think that the the just online distance learning is actually valuable for that. And I think the other part of it was, and I think, well, you want to say something, Cynthia? I, well, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, say it. Sure, if you want. It's an open discussion. I think that's what Chat GPT. I didn't want to bring it up, but but Chat GPT lets you much more uh, tailor conversations to the uh, to the user to the particular individual. Otherwise, what what uh, Margaret said sounds just like Pat Sufi's. Um, which I mean, Pat was Pat was you know sort of a purist in the sense of uh, behaviorist um, computer assisted instruction, but you can see the the mapping of a child how the child got through the things depended on his correct or incorrect answers. So it's so it's the similar thing and i always yeah. love to tell the story of visiting one of sufi's uh you know one of the schools with sufi stuff and with seymour and we observed this one young man continually getting the wrong answer so we asked him about it and he said of course i know the right answer but it's much more fun to get the wrong one yep that, that was always that's been a problem with uh, computer assisted instruction for since it started i mean it doesn't matter whether it was it was a cur computer curriculum co uh, corporation or plato or 101 basic games or Oregon Trail, which was in 101 basic games. Um, yeah, once, what I'm once, talking about, what I've been talking about though, is where you've got real in-person teachers interacting with the students and commenting on work, not computer, uh, computer-based lessons, but actual lessons going back and forth between a teacher and a student. Does it matter whether it's a computer or a telephone or an, or face to face for that particular aspect of teaching? So, sorry, what's the question? Does it does it matter if if what we're we're saying is in order to individualize or personalize instruction? Good you have a human being looking at the student's response. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I'm not talking about computer based software where the student puts in an answer and then the computer says no that's not right and then the computer and the student puts in a different answer i'm talking about uh real life people communicating they don't have to be looking at each other they can be communicating through uh typed comments back and forth to each other i think we have so, to just differentiate between whether we're talking about a message initiated by one human being going through some sort of communication pipe and being received by another human being, or whether we're saying that there's a machine in the middle that's altering the communication between the two human beings. The fact that there's well, a I'm not, Yeah, I'm not talking about what, what you're saying. I'm saying person to person. Okay. The, the student does an assignment, uh, submits it, the teacher gets the assignment, looks it over, and whether they have um, video conferencing, or whether it's done in an asynchronous method, 
the teacher still gets back to that particular student on his work. There's no in-between person or machine. That's what I was talking about. So, so maybe we can ask a, a question that's more uh, like the work that um, Engelbart was doing that says, how can we use computers to enhance the teacher and have a, a collaboration between a computer and a teacher in order to enhance the educational experience of the learner? That's a different question, but I think it's an, an important question that comes up as a result of this discussion. You have another another question, Jeff. So um, I guess part of the other the question was also: um, Are there ways for students to um, contribute to enhancing the lessons? I think that must mean like um, somehow give feedback to improve the lessons in future. Sure. There's, there's always well, that's always up to the teacher, but there's always a back and forth and most teachers will welcome suggestions from students on uh maybe tweaking an assignment or or uh adding another assignment i think that that's valuable to receive that input from a student most teachers would accept that not that they're changing the syllabus or the curriculum but that they are exploring this if it relates to the lesson that they're talking about not if they're yeah. using, not if they're using code.org what code.org if they're using if they're using having their class use code.org there's only one way to solve a problem well it doesn't sound like any of us are using that <laughs> That's not oh well. Okay. Brian, any any questions or comments? Just very quickly. Oh, I wanted to say this to Cynthia that was part of one of the things is um teachers have to have a good model of the students. And um, yeah. you you did a remarkable job of that despite not buying into models and stuff. <laughs> yes. And that's yes. what I'm actively working on at this point in a project called Kepler knowledge-based environment for personalized learning using an artificial intelligence recommender which is k-e-p-l-a-i-r so anybody who wants to talk about that that's it that's not vintage computing that's forward-looking all right so i do have another question um someone says in a college uh freshman year english class they use hypercard and did a publishing project of the class writing at the end. Um, are there any equivalents today to this experience of, of that? Is there everyone, uh, first of all, everyone familiar with HyperCard? Yes. I am. No. So HyperCard was like a publishing um, tool on the Macintosh. Um, um, you can do programming and do other things. You can, it's like an authoring tool, I think, they, if they, they called it. So you can actually type on a card and then you can flip to the next card and you can like sometimes click on things and it can make sounds or, or even videos. Um, and I guess, and maybe that's what he's trying to say is that, is there something similar to that nowadays that, uh, um, that students may have that you're aware of? Uh, I'm trying to be polite. I'll jump in. <laughs> I haven't been. Well, <laughs> well, what would in, you say if you were trying to be polite? In 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 my experience, that's what a website is. Uh, and a website is is a very uh, flexible hypercard deck, hmm. where you, as the website designer get to design every page and link either the whole page or parts of the page. So yeah, I mean, I, I took a, I met Ted Nelson, who was the inventor of hypertext and uh, we had a real good interaction and it's, and I took a course that included hypercard. It's lots of fun. Um, 
we have, and there are lots of tools that are that that let you do hypertext. Um, but hypertext and and hypercard are very different. Yeah, I know well, about hypertext, but not hypercard. Well, hypercard is an example of high, uh, it's a tool. It's a programming, a, a very high level language. Well, program. Most programming languages are tools, but this is. Yes, and hypertext is uh, hypercard is one of them. It was a very nice implementation on a, on the Apple. Yeah, the the hyper, hypercard was an exceptionally nice implementation. Exceptional. No, it was, it, it was a very good one. Then, um, in fact, we when we were doing MicroWorld's logo, we were inspired by it. And mm -hmm. the main thing that we did different than hypercard, and in fact, um, back after hypercard for the Apple II was Hyper Studio. 2GS, which was a color hypercard, and that was quite nice. And um, we thought that they, they, there was a lot of good ideas there. The one thing, thing that we did is all of the quote unquote links um, were done not through dialog boxes, but through code snippets. Through what? Code, little bits of code. Oh, okay. You know, the, the way you did anything, if you clicked on a button um, with hypercard, if you clicked on a button, it would give you a dialog for the 10 things that it could do. Right. But what we did instead is if you, um, inside a button was a little piece of logo code to run. And of somewhere, somehow between Microsoft's logo and Scratch, the notion of page got dropped. Right, which, you know, uh, the Microsoft's logo page was very much like a hypercard card. Okay, so so a page and a card are are analog. pretty much the, yeah pretty much the same thing. And what we were inspired by by hypercard was the fact that there was a um there was just a small collection of concepts. There were cards, there were buttons, there were text fields. There were very few things. So when right. we did the world's logo, we had equivalently a, a similar set of small number of things. So can you some of the um, you could use Figma today. You could use uh, lots of the web web designers design programs or platforms today uh, to do a hypercard like. Again, it, it it was it was elegant in its simplicity. But so, what it was, it was elegant. When you say it's like a web modern HTML5, it's true. But hypercard, um, its power came through its constraints. Okay. Right, you know that um, you, you couldn't do anything in the universe. You could do, uh, it's another case we were talking earlier about, you know, building sets and, you know, based on the, you know, Hypercard was another case where it, it had a relatively small collection of things and all of the greatness was in connecting those things together in a way that you would do it yourself rather than built into the system. Uh, Lincoln Logs and Lego are other examples and tinker toys are other examples of construction sets they are physical construction sets that uh, many of us played with as children uh get a little bit more complex and you get an erector set and <laughs> a huge number of today's and structural engineers who started out with erector sets well the most complicated thing i built with any of the above was with tinker toys well come on do you know what he built well, this is a VCF, so probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, How long did it take you guys to build that? How what? How long did it take all of you to build the, the Tinker Toy? Uh, um, the first one that didn't work, we designed in a couple of weekends, and then my um, first wife, Lynn, spent every afternoon for four months building it. The second one, which did work, we drove down to the museum for, and we were only going to be there for weeks. So we built it on the museum floor in a week. By the way, for um, we didn't say this out loud. This is the Tinker Toy Tic-Tac-Toe machine. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. Dudeney wrote it up. Yeah, Dudeney wrote it up. It was a very good article about it. Does one exist yet yes. still? No, one existed, and um, I don't no, know. It, 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 well, we built it at the um, Mid America Center in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It's a long story, but the short form of the story is um, about four or five years after we built it, the daughter of the governor got in, had a bad after school experience. So the wife of the governor convinced the governor to sack the museum director, and the um, 
new museum director, as all good museum directors, just got rid of all of the old exhibits and put in new ones. Now, I heard this story, and it was from the mid '90s. So the Ryan, question there's that, a picture. Oops, yeah. Sorry. So um, in the mid '90s, who was the governor, the wife of the governor, and the daughter of the governor? Um, Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay. So my machine got rele relegated to the basement because of a fight between Hillary and a museum director. But there is one that was at the Boston Museum of Science. Yeah, that one never really worked. That never worked, but the no. physical. But, but it's very pretty. Is, yeah. is there one at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View? No. Yeah, that's the one. That's where it ended up. It's, do you oh, know if it's on display still? Huh? I don't think it's currently on display, but I don't know. I haven't been there okay. I, okay. two and a half hours north of there now. Oh, the Boston Museum gave it up? Yeah, the, well, because a lot of the uh, the, um, the computer history museum just picked up a couple of exhibits when the Boston Museum closed. No, no, it was at the Science Museum, Brian. Oh, are you... The pet, yeah, there was one more step in the path. It went from the science museum to the computer history museum. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, it seems to be from the, the catalog here that it seems to be at the computer history museum right now. Um, it says a gift of uh, what is this, Brian Silverman and Daniel Hillis. Yeah, so it's interesting. I didn't know about that. That, that all you know, that also will, um, you know, one of um, VCF members, um, Bob Roswell, did a whole history of tic-tac-toe machines. Um, and I don't know if he talked about this one or not, but he, it was always interesting to, to, to see into that because people, you know, you know about, you know, modern electronic tic-tac-toes, but he didn't realize how far it went back and how different people tried different ways of, of uh, making it work. But if you're interested in that, there's a, there was an article in Scientific American from the 80s where Key Dugney actually explained in really good detail the one that did work. So do we have a, uh, a logo tic-tac-toe, a logo version? Oh, we, did. we did tic-tac-toe and logo. But I remember working with some kids, and when they found out there was a non-losing strategy to the game, they didn't want to play it anymore. <laughs> they were, it really broke their hearts. Oh, yeah. uh, don't tell them that there's a non-losing strategy for chess that, you know, Alpha Zero recently worked out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, I don't want to play chess. <laughs> no. Um, uh, are we ready like, for another question, or you, you want to have some comments? I, I, well, I... I, I just for our listeners, when we find out where things are, uh, I think it's always nice to add, since we're making a trace of this conversation, to add uh, potential links. If, where would somebody go to find uh, a copy of a logo tic-tac-toe program? I would always Google it, but I know on the Commodore side, there's different uh, repositories online of of uh programs games um things like that um i assume that's um well i guess there was a logo for the commodore 64 um but in the commodore that has a whole database of of games um, I'm, so, I'm sure that that exists for um other computer or even logo I, i'm sure it's, it's got to be out there somewhere books <laughs> Is that right, Brian, Brian Silver? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember. It seems to me he did it, or somebody did it. Somebody must have done it. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll leave it as an exercise for the visitor to find a copy of that. Okay. But, we, but make a new one. So we, I, we, Danny and I designed the machine that failed uh, with big list program, and I designed the one that worked with the logo program. <laughs> You have another question for us? Uh, yes. So another one is, were there any unexpected benefits of introducing computers into education? Uh, 
<laughs> um, one, of the, one of the benefits that that um, I used to, to introduce when I was talking to doing teacher training you know, on how, how to use a computer in the classroom is to say, yeah, one of the benefits is that these machines are often intrinsically motivating for the most disruptive student in your class. And it may be that that rather than saying, oh, everybody has to have an equal time on the computer, the best way to enhance your classroom function is to take that disruptive student, sit them in the back of the classroom with a computer game, get them out of your way so that you can teach. Uh, <laughs> that was an unanticipated uh, um, outcome. Um, yeah, the distraction having, for the unruly child. All right. Cynthia, any any uh, any uh, any any unexpected things in your experience? It was all unexpected. Oh, uh, because it was all new. It was like a novel it, thing. Well, every time I've ever worked with a group of people, whether they're ten or fifty, something unexpected happens. Something I didn't anticipate. That's why I love working with computers, because it's somebody is bound to have an aha experience and share with me, and I have an aha experience as a teacher. It's it's very exciting. All right, uh, Brian. That's if that if you believe that you the people you're working with will come will if you're the catalyzing agent that they will catalyze <laughs> and um and that's why i bring up code.org which is one of the most popular sites in schools around the world around the united states anyway they send all their students there and I, uh, my experience was that I could write a program in three other ways, but I wasn't allowed to. And that isn't being creative or, you know, allowing free, free expression. Right. Brian, and any, uh, I mean, you were sort of in the same environment as her, but anything that was unexpected that um, when you're introducing computers in education, any unexpected? Well, as Cynthia may have expected it, but I found what's unexpected is teachers liked, um, the, liked Logo because it provided a window into students thinking. Mm -hmm. so yeah, to get into the, to the brain, because that's always like the, the, the black box, like what's going on into their head, you know. Well, like, what it did is the, the, when kids would be trying things, the exact things that they were trying really reflected the way they were thinking about the problem, you know, in a way that, that many teachers said it, it was unusual and good. The second thing that was unexpected is it turned out to be a crystallization point for groups of people that enjoyed hanging out together. Wow. Oh. Yeah, that's also you see like the social be benefit of it, you know. That so I mean that's what you're seeing is unexpected. So kids like you know collaborating on things or suggesting things, and working together. Um, Margaret, any unexpected benefits that you saw of uh, using computers in education? Well, early on, being, being an English teacher. Uh, what I mentioned before was the benefit of having the students be able to edit their work and that encouraged them, that motivated them to do that and that improved their writing. That was something that maybe we didn't expect, but that's what what it resulted in. And it, it made um, another thing that was interesting to me, as it turned out, was that um, many of the early uses of computers in the classroom, from what I could gather, uh, was that teachers were using them to actually teach telecommunications. And back then, it, the telecommunications, it, it, it would result in not only being able to collaborate with others, 
to, you know, teachers could collaborate with teachers, students could get together and chat with each other, even back then through a message board or through a simple chat text based thing. But during those experiences where they were going online, they were learning about telecommunications, which as it turned out, would be huge in their futures. So I think that the, um, the whole world of telecommunications that blossomed out of computers being in people's homes um, was something that maybe wasn't expected early on. All right. Uh, anybody, any questions or comments before I move on to the next one? Well, I think that a, a lot of teachers um, did not anticipate that the computer would be a catalyst for more collaborative classrooms where the teacher and the students collaborated together. Uh, there were there were many teachers that I talked to who whose approach had been they were supposed to know no more than the students and uh, they had to teach and the students had to learn. And with when we began introducing computing into the classroom, the teachers discovered that many of the kids had more time than the student than the teachers did to learn about computing. And there were alliances and collaborations that formed between teachers and students that uh, hadn't happened before. And that was a surprise to many, many teachers. All right, uh, anybody else? I just right. would like to add this aspect of how uh, telecommunications grew. The, the whole aspect of doing research that was very important also that maybe wasn't expected. Um, for, for the students to be able to log on and access encyclopedias and uh, other research materials, that was huge. And being able to access libraries and interlibrary loan systems just by logging on with their computers, that was big. And that started off uh, the aspect of using research on your home computer, being able to do that uh, it started with the CD-ROM, with the encyclopedias on the CD-ROM, but then when that, that very soon that jumped into the online medium, um, that whole aspect of research, I think, really helped students because before then they'd have to drag themselves off to the library and figure out how to use the card catalog system and all this and that um, by doing it from their home computer or if they had to do it at school using the school computer. Um, it, it just opened up a world of information for them. Yeah, a whole um, wealth of, of knowledge in that wouldn't be as easily accessible. What's, what's interesting about that is that the information was there. When you take an encyclopedia and you put it on a CD-ROM, you're not adding new information, you're changing the channel through which the the reader or the learner accesses the same information. It's much easier to find it, isn't it? You just type in, the, you know, your term that you're looking for and, and boom, it brings you to that page. Only if you type the right keywords in. I don't think it's easier. And I often go back to books because I'm more skilled with them. It may be easier. I am, I am too, but for the for the people who uh, started to use the CD-ROM encyclopedia, comments that we got back then uh, from my job where I was working at RUN, uh, people really got a kick out of that. They really enjoyed that because it sped up it sped up their research, and they didn't need to have a whole set of encyclopedias in their house, which maybe they couldn't even afford to have but they could have it all in one spot on their computer and access it on the computer. Yeah, so it reminds me of, you know, when I was looking up things like LexisNexis and other databases of the time, you had to learn how to write the keywords and, and adding certain keywords and subtracting keywords. So you're trying to like, in a way with like with ChatGPT, where you're trying to tell it what you're trying to ask it to give you the right 
uh, information back, you know, try to train, like, what do you, you know, information? So this, this, and minus this, and the results. So, so you're trying to train it to, to the database to find information that you're looking for, or because then, you know, if you type in too general, then you're going to have too many results, and you don't want to. You know, yeah, it, exactly right. And back then, there were companies like Dialog that would provide uh, research uh, training to students and to schools. They would have school programs, and they would teach the students how to do these types of uh, keyword searches. And and it was so competitive. They actually would have uh, competitions, high school competitions, where one school would um, compete against another, and how quickly they could find something. Uh, so I, I kind of got a kick out of that. But that was what they used to do back in back in the old days. So there's an interesting one because back in the old days, one of the things that a lot of people were saying then, what kids would lose is if it's a real encyclopedia, you'll find something interesting in the article on the next page. And now, as it turns out, with the online version of it, you do find yourself finding, um, if anything, more random stuff and a better selection of more random stuff than just things that happen to have the same initial letter. Yeah, adjacent in the encyclopedia, like. And, and, and what's interesting is actually, I don't know how, where, what the state of the world is, is um, in a period of about 10 years, school research went from very hard to get stuff. And if you got stuff, you could trust it to now your um, information overload. And most of the stuff that you get is junk. So, A lot of it is junk. Yeah. yeah um, so the research skill went from being how to find it to what to believe. And what to, yeah. to, what to, what to filter out and the, the filtering okay. of the information in constant like battle to, to keep the good stuff and remove the bad. We, Wikipedia was always about weeding out what wasn't true. It's gotten better now, but when it first started, because any random person could put any random bit of information on it, there was all this reaction of don't trust what you get from Wikipedia. And today that's that people don't uh, say that. So I'm just juxtaposing that, um, I mean, scamming is, scams are big business today, but, but places like Wikipedia are more. <laughs> We've learned how to, um, to edit ourselves to crowdsource not only the the concepts that get put online, but to then do the an analysis of that. Um, and I don't know whether where their kids are very good at that. And that's some that's also a discussion about um, chat GPT because I think it's the same sort of thing you want to bring of writing and being able to critique the writing that gets produced. I mean, there's a whole skill in that. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's going to be the future. Um, well, and the encyclopedia doesn't hallucinate. The encyclopedia being published has, the editing has been done before the public gets a well, chance to read it. You just understood, a show of hands, who trusts Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you haven't had the usual set of bad experiences with it? Well, I think no. what it says about me is untrue. Well, I, I don't know. Well, how much why don't you fix it? it? Because it's you can't. Hard. Yes, it's you can. It's very hard to fix. It's very hard I, to I fix. I asked a friend of mine to fix it, and maybe she has. Um, I think on the editors, there are certain editors assigned to different topics and they have to approve the topics. Yeah, but who knows who the editors are? No. Yeah, oh, I, I don't no, know. You should always have three sources, though. So you could use Wikipedia as a, a starting point, mm -hmm. but then branch out 
and find other sources. And if they corroborate it, then maybe you could trust what they're saying. But, but isn't that um, with any information source? Yes. No, let me fully agree. Um, I totally don't trust Wikipedia, but it often has pointers to good sources. Yeah. So it, it is exactly as Margaret saying. It's a very good starting point. Right. I, 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 look, I look at the URLs it points to. Yeah. Yeah, that's one good thing is that it does have a bibliography at the end and references so that you can go and, and go further in, into your research rather than just what's written on that page. But, but Wikipedia did predate ChatGPT in hallucinating things that presents with full confidence. Yes. Uh, but it was a, not, the, the Wikipedia articles are not automatically generated. That's true, but they're written uh, by a human. But they're written by humans often, I shouldn't say often, occasionally with inadequate information. Mo well, many times. That's why we don't trust it. <laughs> well, I, I, I trust it to be a good starting place. But I don't, I mean, I often go to Wikipedia to start a, a, a research a, a, a research journey. Most, but I don't believe it just because it's on Wikipedia. Most of what I use for Wikipedia is when I'm doing a job search, and for this is for education, for teaching jobs, I research the, um, the demographics of the city, um, what kind of... <laughs> is the, the education like the schools that's what i've been mostly using it for i haven't necessarily used it and, and, and other than that i would probably like you know try to look up different vintage computer um people that i had never heard of i'll type in this name and try to look up you know what they're about um uh, but the well, I've, obviously the first one is just facts you know collection of facts you know this 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 city has this many people and, and with demographics and this income and and this is the type of schools and this is how good they are so but otherwise the other one is is more like you know you know what kind of research people have done on that person and sometimes I, you don't find the person you I, regret, I regret not collecting computers that run low different versions of logo now brian implemented several versions and he probably has computers. Do you have computers? No, they break over time. You know, the trouble with, with vintage oh, stuff. Okay. Is, is, I, I, there's probably the right place to whine about the fact that they're hard to keep going. This is why our art is going. Yes. They're, yes. they're hard to keep going. You have to repair them. So that's why at Vintage Computer Federation, we have mo monthly, almost monthly repair workshops. And these guys just love it's like a for them it's like a pop puzzle to solve to fix them so we're we have a group that constantly meets once a month to repair these things so yes i understand your pain because we do get some phone calls sometimes for people like um you know i need to get this floppy from this to this and you know you know can you repair this or you know different parts of the country yes well i have another question for brian how many um how many computers have you uh, implemented online? About seven or so. Now, do any of them I run local? Mostly, um, well, actually, the uh, some of the more interesting ones never got published because um, we, we were really, really sensitive to IP issues. And the thing that's closest to running a logo is um, Smalltalk 72 from 75, which, you know, really, really looks like logo, but we don't really have legal right to it. So we never put that online in any way. And you can also keep in mind that there are emulators, so you don't necessarily have to use the original computers to. to no, but that's what he made. Yeah, that's what I meant. This, this is an emulator, and, and the thing that we found is anything from about 1980 onwards, there's a good emulator. So what we sort of concentrated on was earlier than that. So uh, which, could you name the ones that you've done? Um, the PDP eight and PDP one eight and eleven, the IBM three sixty. The, you um, did the PDP one? Yeah, that's what the Space Wars running on it. Oh yeah. Right, and um, the the Alto, 
because no, Cynthia, I showed this to you years ago. Um, that version of small talk really looks like somebody had um, went to visit the logo lab and then on the way back on the airplane decided to invent object oriented programming. That was Alan Kay. <laughs> and that was Alan Kay. So it turned out to have been exactly that. So it's, it's, it's this amazing work because um, it, ha it has half of the modern UI and about two thirds of object oriented programming. Both are in very, very, very crude forms. All right, um, I'm going to start to wrap it up. We have about 10 minutes if, if we're going to stick to two hours. Um, so Brian, you sort of were talking about there about like what current projects you're working on. Um, so someone asked a question for you, Liza, about um, where would we find out more about your Kepler project and, and how to participate? Uh, <laughs> great question. I really, I really need a good, I love to do web programming, but I mean, uh, websites, but our website is horrible right now, but it's kepler.live, K-E-P-L-A-I-R.live is the Kepler website, um, which is fast degenerating. Um, they can write to me at Liza Loop at loopcenter.org or go to the loopcenter.org website. Okay. L-O-O-P-C-E-N-T-E-R.org website and uh, then there'll be links to our various projects there's a link to the kepler project all right wonderful and cynthia are you working on any any new projects right now well i'm doing a lot of turtle stitch yeah and uh, that's what i'm doing and uh, i'm working with um susan klimzak and we're starting we're going to do a work a 10-week workshop in a in a week all right nice and margaret any new projects you're working on well i'm teaching currently teaching online and i'm still operating the school uh, one thing that people might be interested in is on our website i've put together a page uh, called the history of online distance learning mm -hmm. and in it i have a lot of uh, documents from back in the 80s primarily that will provide a lot of information about what was happening back then. So the uh, the URL is calcampus.edu slash research dot htm. So I think I'll um, calcampus please C A L C A M P U S dot edu slash research dot htm. And I add to that periodically. I actually, I've put one of uh, my recent presentations at the VCF up in there too. So it's growing. Good, wonderful. And Brian, anyone want to add anything? I wasn't sure if that was you. I really. Sure. This is if anybody wanted to um, look at some of the things I've worked on in the past, often with with Paolo Bonta, slash projects all right wonderful so um any last words before we wrap this up and end the uh, the live stream uh liza <laughs> well one thing that i didn't get a chance to say earlier when we were talking about sort of student participation in personalization and curricular individualization is that um some people are using open educational resources many of which carry Creative Commons licenses that let you take whatever pieces you want out of a published piece of curricular material and make derivative works out of it. Um, and there are teachers out there who are using those open educational resources and saying to their students, well, help, let's make this better. And that becomes a project-based uh, learning experience for teacher and student to collaborate together. So that puts puts together several different trends in education. And a lot of what the work that I'm particularly interested in is, is um, the learner agency. So how do we create contexts where the learner is more in charge of their own education? Um, and of course, computing all different forms of computing help us do that. So that's a whole, maybe that's another discussion that we could get into. All right, uh, Cynthia, any last words? 
Um, no, I don't have. It's okay. That's all right. I think we talked a lot. I had too many words. To be... All right. <laughs> Margaret, any last words? Uh, no, I'm, I'm with Cynthia. I think we said it. All right. And Brian? Well, since people are all wrapping up with no last words, I'll follow along. All right. So, you know, this I think it was a good second uh, talk, a good discussion, and we have a bunch of different ideas for the next one. I can, I'll review this at some point, and uh, I'll schedule another one, uh, maybe for January or so, um, and I'll see what you guys are availability. Uh, but thank you for this talk. I, you know, it was fun for me. I was hoping it was fun for you too. Maybe if people are listening to the to the video. Uh, and they can think of other places where we might want to announce this. They could put that in the comments of the video on the video, and you could pick those up, Jeff. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, if anybody has um, any recommendations on where else we can advertise the the talks, um, I'm getting better at it. <laughs> uh, sort of just jumped into it. It's like let's try this, and, and it seems to be somewhat successful. And um, live interaction may not be you know uh, what everybody's doing but um at least afterwards we do see comments and um and people can always chime in and say hey you know here uh, here's a good place for you to advertise it so that we can get more interaction live and if they have a topic that they want us to, to address oh absolutely else yeah. we should add to this conversation i mean uh, we're pretty much open to whatever the rest of the world wants to say this is not just our party it's everybody's party have you been in touch with the computer history museum to tell them that you've been doing this i have not um i didn't even consider that um i do know one of the curators there dag spicer so i could ask him if they would be interested in uh advertising it's yeah like uh, that's a good idea Putting our heads together. <laughs> well, that's great. All right. So then if there's this nothing else. Fun. Thank you. I hope I wasn't too. <laughs> no, you know, it's it's you have the proper level of, of the way to be. Exactly. Everybody. That's why we invite you, Cynthia, because we want <laughs> you with all your personality. <laughs> it's all been right. my downfall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the stream uh, in five, four, three, two, one, and all right. Bye.